Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Alejandro. Uh, and this talk will be about JavaScript engines. You will find that through all the documentation and references, uh, they are also referenced as uh, virtual machines, so this could be considered as an introduction to a subtype of virtual machines. But before we continue, I wanted to say three things about this talk first. The first one is why I care about these things. At some point, I became obsessed with performance and speed, but it's something uh, I think we all can relate to. We cheer for the fastest car, the fastest swimmer, the fastest runner. And in programming, we look for faster applications, faster algorithms, faster functions, and faster micro-operations. I realized that to um, answer some of these uh, questions, I needed to understand these things. The second uh, thing I wanted to tell you is why I think you should care about this talk. I believe that having some understanding on this subject will give you the tools to think and reason about what makes your code fast or slow. And as you go, you go deeper into the more complex details, you will gain uh, insight in all the ranges between those two extremes. The third one on last is a really big disclaimer. I'm fascinated by virtual machines and compilers, but I'm not a virtual machines specialist. And certainly do not represent any of the browser vendors mentioned here. If you find something that's wrong or could be phrased in a better way, please reach out to me. So I started my path going through that. By the way, that's me. If you can recognize me, it's probably the hair, but um, it's OK. Uh, I started my path going through the history of JavaScript engines, and I found an inflection point around 2006, 2007. Before that time, engines were pretty straightforward. They, uh, the engine would took the source code and would parse it to an abstract syntax tree, um, or AST for short. And I, AST will omit comments, parentheses, commas, semicolons, all of the things that are part of the syntax and will represent block, blocks and statements as nodes in a tree structure. The next step would be to transform the AST to bytecode, which is an internal representation. Bytecode can be described as a well-defined set of instructions and can be also considered as a portable representation, since the bytecode instructions will not change through the different CPU architectures. Machine code, on the other hand, will change uh, its architecture specific, meaning that for the same lines of JavaScript, its machine code will vary from a model CPU to desktop or laptop CPUs. The final step needed for, the running, for running your program is what I call an execution phase, which is often described as a really big switch statement that for each bytecode instruction will graph and uh, will jump to the appropriate code. Like in most high-level languages, JavaScript will not deal with memory allocations explicitly. You can create objects, and all those objects will be allocated internally by the engine. <clears throat> those objects can also be unreferenced, and in order to reuse those precious bits of memory, the system will need a garbage collector. There are different strategies to implement garbage collectors, but we will leave those details for later. Turns out this setup, this architecture, is considerably, considerably slow, where slow means implicitly comparing to the performance of a C or C++ program after all the optimizations are applied. So a group, a group of brilliant people worked on improvements over this architecture in the 70s for Fortran, in the 80s for a small talk and self front times. And they came up with this concept of adaptive optimization. With the idea, the idea is to identify the pieces of uh, your program that are executing too often, or also called hot functions, and to compile them on runtime. Hence the name just in time compiler or sheet compiler for short. After compilation, the engine wouldn't have any overhead for running the code. 
while with just the interpreter, it will have to go through the, the really big switch from uh, bytecode instructions to the code each time you are executing that. This approach is also a great opportunity to apply the optimistic optimizations in dynamic languages like JavaScript. For example, collecting type information about the context of a function call could open the possibilities for type specializing optimizations. In order to optimize property access in the GNOME languages, inline caches, or ICs for short, were invented. Inline caches are a way to save a fast path. The first time it access the property, it will use a slow path, but will recall all the steps needed to get it. Global variables, variables from closures, and even prototype chains can be optimized by ICs. Imagine that after optimization, a 100 objects length prototype chain could ha have almost the same performance that accessing a property of an object with no prototype at all. And that's amazing. That's the performance improvement you could get by just using inline caches. The basis for most engines implementations consists of an uh, interpreter and two optimizing compilers. On your left, the one that optimizes compilation time, and on your right, the one that optimizes ex execution time. The one optimizing execution time, also called optimizing compiler, will highly depend on the uh, type information collected from the system. The unoptimizing unoptim compiler would uh, generally create inline caches and help collect uh, type information. Type changes in the code could trigger type, the type specializing compiler to recompile, and in some cases, after uh, an excessive amount of type changes, the, the compiler could desist and penalize the code, marking it as non-optimizable. Switching to a real-world architecture, SpiderMonkey is not too far from the previous example. It will receive the source code and will transform it to uh, a bytecode. After the number of times a function is executed goes over a certain threshold, it will then be uh, marked as optimization by the first uh, compiler, which is baseline. After the number of times a function is executed goes, as, uh, goes over a second threshold, it will then be marked as um, candidate for really, really good optimization. That's when IOMonkey kicks in. And with the bytecode plus the type information collected, it will compile the function with all the uh, optimizations that can. Like the previous example, where both compilers would bail out to the interpreter, in this case, the code will bail out to the baseline sheet. In the case of uh, Chakra Core, it shares a similar architecture to SpiderMonkey. It has an interpreter, an optimizing, uh, an optimizing compiler, which is a simple sheet, and an optimizing compiler, full sheet. The interesting part about Chakra Core is that it can fire additional threads to compile or to run the garbage collection. Imagine that you're running the engine on a four-core CPU. In theory, you could take advantage of that and uh, compile, uh, parallelize uh, the sheet compilation in three of those cores. In the case of B8, it has recently switched to a four-tiered architecture. It has an interpreter, it has an unoptimizing compiler, also called full code gem, and two optimizing compilers, crankshaft and turbofan. The full Cogen compiler resembles to the baseline sheet uh, of SpiderMonkey. Both will create inline caches. If B8's profiler uh, identifies that a function is taking a good proportion of the execution time, it will then notify the, the system to optimize it. Both Crankshaft and Turbofan uh, applies optimistic uh, optimizations and type specializing optimizations. Their idea is to deprecate uh, eventually crankshaft and full code gen and just leave ignition and the, and the turbofan compiler. 
JavaScript core has also a four-tiered architecture, has an interpreter, an unoptimizing compiler, and two optimizing compilers, DFG compiler and FTL. If an a statement is uh, executed more than 100 times or the function is called more than six times, the engine will then optimize uh, with the baseline compiler. Once uh, the statement goes over 1,000 times or the function is called more than 66 times, the function will be compiled using DFG. Once that number goes over 10,000, the FTL compiler kicks in. As you can see, there's a component inside the FTL, which is a little VM. A little VM is a compiler that applies all sorts of optimizations and serves as a backend for FTL. That means the engine would gather the time inform information, the bytecode, and transform that into a lower level representation to fit that into a little VM. They also recently switched to, uh, to another backend for the FTL compiler called B3, but that's only on OSX machines. Uh, and they were looking to, to keep all the optimizations they wanted, but uh, reduce the compilation time. We just briefly talked about the different architectures for most advanced uh, JavaScript engines. Now let's, let's talk about the specific optimizations they are all applying. Let's say you have a loop executed many times and inside uh, its body a single expression of finding the variable where incremented multiplied by some arbitrary number. The reasonable performance improvement would be to make the calculation once and reference it through a temporary variable in all the iterations. All the engines mentioned here applies this optimization internally and it's called loop invariant code motion. One of the simplest optimizations a JIT compiler could apply is called function inlining. Let's come back to your canonical loop and inside its body we execute a function. If the loop iterates a certain amount of times, the profiler will identify the function as hot and if some conditions apply, it will grab the function's body and paste it directly inside the loop. Now, you might be wondering why it should be faster since it's the same code. In low-level programming languages like assembly, calling a function would end up in a context switch. Recently after uh, the function call, you will have to save the previous context. And right after you return from the uh, function, you will have to resume that saved context. Let's continue with the, the next optimization. Imagine a loop with just an, an expression. It could be any expression you want, but if it doesn't have side effects, like assigning the result to a variable, uh, that's one, yeah. Like assigning the result to a variable or returning the result, it could be optimized by just avoiding doing anything at all. And that's what the compiler will do internally, just remove the expression. This is uh, optimization is called death code elimination. And some compilers like the JVM would, would go further and delete the whole loop. Just be aware that some of, of the features of JavaScript will inhibit type specializing optimizations like the evil function, the with operator, and try catch blocks. We mentioned before that there's different strategies to implement garbage collecting systems. Here you can see a, a brief comparison of all the different implementations. Generational garbage collectors will group objects by their lifespan and will assume that young objects are more likely to live, uh, to die, sorry, than uh, old objects. Under this uh, strategy, the new objects are created in a nursery space and long-lived objects are moved to a tenure space. Incremental GCs interleave their work with the activity from the main program, while on the other hand, uh, a stop the world uh, strategy will halt the execution of the main program until a full collection is done. GCs can also be described as precise 
or conservative ones. Precise ones can identify all the references, while conservative ones will, find, uh, will look for memory patterns to find references. Thus, la the, the last approach could lead to false positives, but that's not always a problem in practice. In this following link, you can find all the resources that I use while working on this presentation. If you want to read more about cheat compilers or garbage collection, and you're interested into the details, there's a lot of material in there. There's also um, some questions that I keep uh, uploading to that, uh, to myself, and there's some uh, uh, conversation about it. Uh, you can always find me after the talk and ask me anything you want. Just to wrap up, um, a good question about uh, this topic that I came, uh, it was how do you measure the overall performance of any of those JavaScript engines? And there's not a really good answer to that. There's a lot of uh, benchmarks out there that, to test all the edge case, but certainly micro benchmarks will not show, show you the whole picture. That being said, I think we all should strive for maintainable and clean code. All the optimizations techniques that I came across have reasonable requirements to apply, like functions to be monomorphic, things more related to dynamic typing and have nothing to do with the using obscure features of the language. That's all, thank you. <laughs>